My name is Keegan Scott Lynch. I know most of you. And welcome, welcome to my presentation on the cultural impact of the Black Death. This here has been a little bit of a long-term project of mine. I've been researching and refining it for a bit over a year at this point. And in time, I've begun to narrow, I have really narrowed my argument down. And this presentation, of course, myself argues that the Black Death is more than just a disease at this point. It's evolved into something more than that. And what I argue, this is the Black Death, or the plague if you prefer, has become what I like to call a cultural trauma of the West. And the aftershocks of all the lives it took and all the families it touched can really be felt reverberating throughout the ages. Now, without further ado, let's get right into it then. Okay, so the first ma manner of business is to define our terms. What do I mean by cultural trauma? Uh, that's fairly simple to define. I define it in this presentation and in my paper on the subject as an event, series of events, or an idea that has affected a culture so negatively that its impacts have reverberated through time like an earthquake. There's other examples of this, the Holocaust, slavery, Ireland's troubles, and I'm here to argue that the Black Death is a European cultural trauma. It's not just a disease at this point, as I've already stated. It's forced its way into being a part of European culture that shook it to its very core. And even to this day, we can sort of see some of the we can sort of see some of the impacts for it. It still has it still is having its due in some ways. Now, this, of course, leads us to another question. I'm sure you're all dying to ask. Why, Keegan, how do you intend to prove this point? And that begets another simple answer, art. And I don't just mean paintings with that, although that is a pretty decently sized part of the puzzle here. But the plague has affected fiction as well, sermons. It's inspired famous pieces of writings, both ancient and modern. And it's provoked in reaction in those who have experienced it firsthand and saw just how devastated people were by it. It was a very visceral reaction. Both theologians and the common man went on about how this was either God's judgment and fury for their sins or something that only he could save them from. They begged for his mercy. And while doing so, great writers and artists reacted by creating artistic displays of the death they saw around them. Of course, I'm not just limiting my scope of evidence to the 14th century spread of the plague. No, this presentation argues that the cultural trauma resounded through the centuries. And so I'm gonna be pulling works from all across those centuries to bolster and show just how long lasting the effects of the plague were, as well as how the fact that the plague's influence ebbed and flow caused the trauma to have far more staying power. Okay, so let's start with the first large European Black Death explosion, which seems to be most famous and most well known in our modern history, that being the 14th century plague outbreak. Now, the exact number of people killed in this event varies from source to source. Uh, the most common cultural figure I hear is a third of, Europeans, of Europe's population, but sometimes I hear sources going to a half, and sometimes I'll be a rarely more than that. Now, this has equally affected the rich and the poor, from farmers to lawyers to royalty. One such source I have listed here, Gabriel de Musis, was an Italian lawyer who survived the plague himself. And after doing so, he had a write-up on his experience of the plague and his own thoughts on the matter. It's a bit long to fully replicate here, and a piece of it goes as follows. I pronounce these judgments. May your joys be turned to mourning, your prosperity be shaken by adversity, the course of your life be passed in never-ending terror. Behold the image of death, behold I open the infernal floodgates. Now the exact context of this line is something I took from Mary Horace's The Black Death. And he goes, he, he continues on from here. He lays blame at the feet of men for their sins and the plague interpreted as God's punishment for the many sins of man. It's seen by him as a part of 
God's holy fury. And there are a handful of allusions to Pestilence, the first horseman, in his writing. Now, of course, this Demesis was hardly the only guy to have something to say about that. And on that, one of the most works of fiction of this time, one of the most famous works of fiction of this time period, the Decameron, starts with the writer talking about his own experiences with the plague and the death he had seen and how it affected him, how it inspired him. And from there, the plot of the book actually progresses. And wouldn't you know, it's about a group of people heading to a private villa to escape the Black Death. Without the plague, the plot of the Decameron just doesn't happen. Without the plague, Boccaccio may not have written the book in the first place. It was both an inspiration and something that haunted him. Now, the same can be said for death art. The first, many of the first examples of which come from this time period, some of which you can see here. Now, one of such one such genre is known as Don's Macabre, and here we have one of the earlier examples of it. It didn't quite start with the Black Death. It started a little bit before the 14th, the 14th century example, but with the Black Death, it exploded. It really started to have a surge in popularity. And as you can see, we on the left here have what is commonly a theme in Dance Macabre, the dead getting up out of their graves and dancing, sometimes with the living. In this case, in this painting, it appears to be people getting up from a mass grave. And on the right here, we have a rather lovely and upbeat piece that depicts death coming to strangle a plague victim. Very, very charming, I'm sure you would agree. <laughs> now, these are just the pioneers of the death art that would come to divine and even stagnate a generation of art, but we will get into that in a little bit. And from here, we admire yet another example. As tends to be the case with instances of mass death, mass graves were soon to follow. And what we have here is a depiction of such. Several coffins are being hauled off while a few people dig to bury the countless dead. This piece is only another example further compounding my point. Now, mass graves would later go on to be kind of a theme when it comes to the plague because there were just so many dead that they could not keep up with burial. Now there are intermittent examples here scattered throughout the centuries. And the next things I'm going to cover are throughout the 15th and 16th centuries. Now the plague didn't just disappear into thin air. It had ebbs and flows rather consistently, outbreaking like it was pulsing, kind of like a heartbeat. And of course, as this went on, more and more death art was published and it began to pile up. And remember the Downs Macabre I brought to attention a couple of slides back? And that became a more popularized form of art that spread throughout the continent, and particularly within Italy's art scene, it caused it to stagnate. It was the market was simply flooded by this death art. Now, this wasn't just the fault of Dance Macabre, but as death art as a whole, Dance Macabre is just one subgenre. It's just cascaded in constantly without an end. Plague art as a whole evolved beyond that and into a generalized depiction of death with the plague, of course, still being at the forefront of much of this. Now, moving on to my examples. Here we have one of my favorite examples, the triumph of death. This is a big and rather famous art piece that is rather simply the depiction of a complete massacre. There are several things going on in this picture and you could take a look at them just by zooming in on one portion or another. There's the living being slaughtered by the dead with no hope for respite, escape, or mercy. And there's more. If you look to the immediate right, oh, you, oh, right, this is from a prior build. You can see the evolution of death art in these pieces, how the examples of Dan's Macabre moved to frescoes, which we are going to see here. And in this fresco in particular, this is another example of Dallas Macabre. This is from, again, an earlier instance, a bit earlier than Peter Brown Keller's Triumph of Death. And in here you can see how Dallas Macabre moved. It didn't stay on the canvas for particularly long and instead moved on to 
frescoes became something of a versatile art form. It wasn't just limited to paintings, drawings. And here is yet another example of Don's Picab, this time from the late 15th century. This one in, part in, in particular is not particularly related to plague, but rather it is in relation to what appears to be the nobility. Now, the interesting part about here is we see the flexibility of Don's Macabre and how it evolved. Like I said earlier, like I said a bit earlier on, Don's Macabre evolved from being strictly completely about the plague and evolved into a more versatile art form from there. Now we move on to the 17th century. And in the 1600s, London got hit by a rather massive outbreak of the plague, which prompted a lot of things. One of which being a writing from Daniel Defoe entitled, A Journal of the Plague Year. Now, much of what is in this book and much of what Defoe writes can be taken with a grain of salt. But the fact that the London plague caused such a fuss to prompt writing it is worthy of note. Furthermore, the contents of this book are a variety of accounts that note a vast array of reactions from many people. The rich who fled the city, the people who remained behind and suffered. And on that first point, anyone with the means to do so fled London during the outbreak. This is fairly similar to the premise of Bichachi's Decameron. It's only in a different country. Now, the death art does not stop here, gentlemen. We still have another example to go. And right here, we have a depiction of the London plague. Now, the interesting part about this one is it was not made immediately following or during the plague. This was made a fair amount of time after in 1864. And that, in my opinion, only strengthens the point of this presentation as we are seeing how the plague had such an impact that even a couple of centuries after the outbreak, art is still being made about it. The London Plague itself made such an impact and had so much influence that it prompted the creation of this art. The plague, in my opinion, gained a sort of cultural immortality. And even long after the London Plague was over, this plaque was created. Now, the plague is still having its due to this day. Whenever something is set back in medieval or up or anything like it, you can probably expect some reference to the plague to be had. This can be had in games such as Dungeons and Dragons actually statting out the disease or in movies. There is, of course, Monty Python and the Knights of the Holy Grail, which of course, opens with a rather famous scene, bring out your dead, bring out your dead as a bunch of corpses the, of, taken by the plague are wheeled out to be brought to a mass burial site. And of course, then we have the 2010 movie appropriately titled The Black Death. No rewards on guessing what that one is about. Though we are hardly still dying of the disease in the hundreds of thousands as we have in the past, it's engraved ourself, itself into our psyche so completely and our memories that we can't stop talking about it. It's become so synonymous with medieval Europe that anything even attempting to mimic it in fiction takes it into account. Thus being so engraved into our cultural memory it is a cultural trauma. And I doubt it's one we're going to forget about even another century into the future. I imagine that anytime there is something depicting medieval Europe, a depiction of the plague is sure to follow. And here are my sources, and I open the floor to questions. Now, how do I stop screen sharing? Oh, you did it for me. Good job, Keegan. All right, any questions for Keegan? Professor Contreras, I see your hand. Um, yes. Well, um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, <laughs> of course, 
as we know, we talked about this last semester. So I have a, a, a basic understanding of, of Black Death, but I, um, I have a, little, a couple of questions about your argument about kind of portraying this as a cultural trauma um, and kind of maybe challenging some of this, some of these ideas. Um, so it, it, it would appear that because disease becomes something regular and it mutates and we have the introduction of different kinds of diseases, that maybe this is, you know, your example of something that was made in, um, you know, what was it? The mid 1800s. Uh, so it comes after the fact is, is maybe that it's this kind of layering of all of the, um, you know, concepts of disease in which the plague um, is only maybe kind of one of the diseases that come, becomes kind of part of this collective memory of Europe. Um, and also wondering if you thought about the ways that, you know, I, I know there's a lot of like imagery about plague doctors today, right? Like that kind of comes up. And I'm wondering if maybe this is, the, the Black Death is less, kind of couched in the experiences and the event itself and now has been disconnected as a symbol rather than um, something that's really about the Black Death itself. Just like we talk about, I mean, I, this is two completely different ideas, but you did mention the Holocaust. We kind of understand the Holocaust as the one event that represents the utmost evil, right? That is a sim symbol of, of kind of, of genocide. So. I don't know if you, I mean, how you kind of approached understanding this as cultural trauma or a kind of collective memory of Europe, kind of a broad question, but. Yeah, that, that is a pretty broad question. And I've got a couple of ways I could tackle that. The first is like the fact that sort of, as you mentioned, we sort of used the Holocaust as sort of the ambassador of what one would be considered the ultimate evil or genocide. In this case, if we're going to be choosing to use the plague as a representative of traumatic diseases, in my opinion, that only goes to further show just how much the plague has ingratiated itself in our cultural memory. If we are going to be selecting, if we are going to be looking at the all these diseases and all the suffering they've caused, and we are going to use the plague as a whole, as a generalized representative of them and plague doctors to represent it, them as well, mm. excuse me, then if you ask me, that only further goes to show that the plague has just ingratiated itself in our minds that much that we just see it as synonymous with. And furthermore, on your point of plague doctors, I what I actually was I actually was considering bringing attention to the plague doctors as a massive meme in the modern day in my initial research, but honestly, I wasn't sure how professional that would look if I just went off into a into a historical paper and start talking about. And in the modern day, there are memes. I wasn't sure about how that would re react to. <laughs> Well, they're source material, right? I mean, if you're, if you're looking at memory, it's one way that people understand the past is transmitted through memes today. So, yeah. <laughs> Additional questions? Natalie? Um, this is more of just like an observation than a question. Um, I thought it was interesting when you mentioned um, about with the Decameron and then later in London, like wealthier classes would flee the cities and like the very populated areas. And you can like kind of see that parallel today with COVID, like people who are wealthier can afford to leave like places like New York City or even like DC or like other hotspots like LA. Um, I, I just thought it would be interesting to like, if you had like any more um, like kind of research or comments on that, like the class kind of how always when there is something like an event like a, pandem a pandemic, which is like what the Black Plague was, like how class divides and like classes like kind of instantly show themselves. I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this correctly. Yeah, that's, the, yeah, I, I think I understand what you're getting at. And that's a rather interesting point. And to me with the plague in particular, I feel like the plague itself 
shows how thin those divides can be. While the rich do run from it, and the rich do flee from it, the rich still die from it. Like I mentioned uh, Gabriel Demusis earlier, early on in my presentation, the man was a lawyer and he still caught the plague. Furthermore, there are examples of certain European nobility catching the plague and suffering from it within their own homes. The plague didn't care. The plague didn't discriminate. The rich tried to flee from it, and the rich had just had the means to do so. But many of them still caught it, and many of them still died from it. And in fact, many of the people who make this death arc are wealthier people. The person who made the triumph of death, death Peter Braukeller, I believe it was mentioned that his father actually passed away from the plague as well. And furthermore, there's some examples I go into in my paper of people such as wealthy clergymen giving sermons, offering prayers to God, hoping for salvation from the plague. These people were all wealthy. These people were all on a different class level from the base peasantry, and they still felt the effects of it. They still suffered from it. They still died from it. And so did their loved ones. Um, let's start with Professor Hale. You can go next, Matt. Hi, Keegan. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, I couldn't, I enjoyed it. And I couldn't agree more that um, clearly um, it's more than a disease. I really like that formulation. And all of us who are living through still living through, right, this pandemic. I mean, I think we have a better and more acute appreciation of that than we did previously. Um, I do wanna ask you a little bit about terminology and this may connect a little bit with Professor Contreras' question. Um, you know, the, the idea of trauma, cultural trauma um, versus historical memory. Is there, should we make a distinction? And again, part of this is about semantics, word choice and maybe you're using trauma in a, a very broad sense. Um, but cultural trauma, like I think about that type of thing, you maybe you have to live through it to be traumatized or for the, the word trauma to be appropriate um, as a historical term um, is a question I have, as opposed to historical memory where you don't have to live through the experience. You can be two, three, four, five generations away from the experience but participate in, you know, in some way, cultural, uh, historical memory of something. Um, and part of this is like, I was thinking about your reference to Monty Python, right? And, you know, the bring out your dead, all of that. Like they're making fun of it because it's, you know, not sort of immediate to them. Um, and so I wonder if that's about, you're right that the, the Black Death is clearly part of our historical memory. Um, but is that different than cultural trauma is my question. And should we think carefully about what terms to use? All right. So for a, a quick little note, note before I really get into this here, I started this research before COVID. This is all just one very unhappy coincidence. So to really dive into your point here now, that is... So that, that is interesting, and I do believe cultural trauma in how I define it is something that I define as like echoing. Like I believe that cultural trauma evolves into historical memory, and that is probably something I should have brought up in my definition within this presentation, which is my bad, but I do believe that cultural trauma is something that leads to historical memory. I do not necessarily believe that all that all historical memory comes from cultural trauma, but I believe that all cultural trauma eventually becomes historical memory as we get further removed from it. Can I just before before Matt, can I just uh, make a comment about the the term trauma? I can see how trauma would be used actually for the second, third, fourth generations because trauma in in at least kind of the way that we understand it in memory studies has been used to say that the trauma is something that 
flows through families and that can be uh, in impacting people who have not actually experienced it the way that that is understood by people. So I can see how it would be used, right, for like the initial art and production that comes, you know, a century after. But I agree with, uh, you know, Professor Hale about how we kind of see it as historical memory. But I really liked your point. I think it's a strong point to make about how the cultural trauma transitioned into um, historical memory. Okay, thanks. Uh, before I get to you, Matt, one little quick thing I want to add to my thing from uh, on my <clears throat> response to Professor Hale here is, yeah, we could, we can make fun of the plague with Monty Python because we're so far removed from it, but I don't think that necessarily stopped people back then because there are examples back then of people of that era having very dark senses of humor and Matt knows what I'm talking about here like there's certain fencing manuals that have jokes of people getting pierced by very phallic looking swords and so Matt your question yeah um basically I I was wondering um how you are defining like the cultural west um, because certainly in the pre-modern period, um, Europe didn't conceive of itself as like Western culture. Um, and so I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering in what way, like how are, how are you defining like the West culturally for this project? For this project, I'm taking a rather generalized, perhaps oversimplified approach approach to it here. And basically how I'm defining it right here is I'm defining it as European countries that experienced that experienced large influxes of the Black Death. And I have a chart on my uh, initial paper that shows the spread of the Black Death, particularly in the 14th century outbreak, starting from Italy and sort of rippling out to Britain. A, a, I believe it was a year, a year and a half later. And that's sort of how I'm defining it in this presentation is I'm defining it as those European countries that have suffered from it, such as France, Britain, Italy, Spain. It's a rather oversimplified definition. I, I do realize that because Europe does have very distinct cultures. I'm simply... <clears throat> putting them under this umbrella for the point of the presentation. Mr. Dolly. Yeah, uh, I, thank you, Keegan, again, for, for a very interesting presentation, as others have said, and, and, and a really uh, intri intriguing paper when you first wrote that. Um, most of my questions have already been asked and answered, but uh, to add one more, and maybe I'm sort of under the influence of the first two presentations, but uh, one of the things that struck me as I was looking at all the images was that, you know, there are men and women in all of those paintings um, dying or carrying dead bodies or, uh, you know, all sort of lumped together. And you talked a little bit about, about class uh, or about plague not recognizing class distinctions, it also did not recognize uh, differences of, of sex or gender. So I'm wondering if, you have enough knowledge of pre-plague art um, to know if part of this cultural transformation was also uh, in, in representations of gender or, or actual uh, gender roles in European society. Okay, yeah, that, that, that is a good question. And it's something I like briefly touched on in the start of my presentation with me saying that Don's Macabre didn't start because of the plague, but it exploded with it. It did exist for a few decades before the first outbreak and then exploded with it. But there is that lack of distinction within those earlier pieces of Don's Macabre. Although to be fair, it, sometimes it is rather hard to tell the, the gender dimensions of a skeleton. Though, in the ones that aren't skeletons, yeah, there really isn't that much of a distinction because there isn't anything really that unifies the human race quite like mass death. 
particularly when it comes to disease, because disease doesn't really discriminate along the lines of gender. At least most of them don't. At least most of them don't. <laughs> but in that regards, yeah, yeah, I do think that is a fairly interesting point a fairly interesting point to make and there certainly is death art before that but a lot of the a lot of the art that like comes before that depicting death is depicting war so in that regard there is a gender dimension to it because there weren't exactly a whole lot of women being sent off to the front lines during in, in 13th 12th 13th century european warfare at least not enough that would be recognized furthermore enough to fill an art piece which i imagine an art piece like that would be seen as rather controversial in that time period but as the plague happened the plague didn't really discriminate one way or another and so that lack of discrimination of the plague i feel got reflected within the art i believe that's that answered your question yeah thanks Professor Contreras. So I did want to bring up that while it didn't discriminate, most of the w people who were digging the graves were women. And so you actually had a higher percentage of women who were involved in transporting these bodies as acting as nurses. And they played a really, really big role in that. Um, so to that question of the fact that it, there is a gender dimension here, and I know that you have a very limited time. How many images, art pieces did you examine in your larger paper, and how did you make those decisions about which ones to analyze? So I made, so to start with the amount I looked at, not every piece of art I looked at actually made it into the paper. I want to say, this is just strictly from memory. I believe the amount of art pieces that made it into the paper were five to seven, I think, maybe six to eight. It's been a little bit since I've looked at the paper itself, aside from to make this presentation. So don't exactly have that number fresh in my head. But the number I looked at beforehand to to sort of filter through and make into this presentation was a few dozen, 36 to 48. I looked at a lot of pieces of art and how I decided what would make it into the presentation was partially it was partially it was chronological because I found a lot of different pieces scattered from a lot of different time periods. So I took ones that I felt were representative of a greater theme that was prevalent in a lot of the art pieces I saw from that time period. And I took those, put them in chrono, like took them and sort of analyzed them from a lens of time to sort of make the point that the plague just kept pounding on in its impact and its death, but that counts as part of impact. All right, any last questions for Keegan? All right, Keegan, great job. Thank you very much.